All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Ido Pat. I'm really excited to welcome you all to our Indie Memphis Movie Club Q&A with Lynn Sachs, our very special guest, director of film about a father who. Um, it's a wonderful documentary that is playing at Indie Memphis right now in the Indie Memphis Virtual Cinema and is available through this Thursday, February 18th at 11.59 p.m. Central Time. Lynn, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. I will honestly say I'm really happy to be here since here is home in Memphis. No, I'm not here. I'm not there. I'm here, which is elsewhere. Well, this is, this is a very special uh, opportunity for me, um, and especially as having been a, a longtime uh, participant and, and organizer and fan and friend of Indie Memphis. Um, and Lynn, uh, knowing you through my, my very, originally my very long friendship with, with your brother, Ira, and then we met, I think, for the first time about 10 years ago at Indie Memphis when you were here with us screening a, a film. Um, and I think we've we've had you with us probably for, I don't know, five or six out of the last 10 years screening screening movies. It's uh, it's wonderful that uh, that we're able to welcome you here again with Film About a Father Who. Well, actually, every time I bring a film home to Memphis, I think how grateful I am because I think about uh, that, uh, uh, how intimidating it can be to to come home and to to bring your work and to show what you've been doing elsewhere but also people understand many layers of who you are so it can make you feel very vulnerable no matter what the subject is yeah and and we'll get it's going to be really interesting to talk about the the memphis connection around around this this particular film especially um and it's and it's really interesting for me for us to have this conversation here tonight because I was lucky enough to watch the film together with you and also with many of your of your family members at the premiere of the film at Slamdance Film Festival almost exactly one year ago. Yeah. Um, and so I guess my first question for you, and we'll, we'll talk uh, for a bit and then we'll open it up to, to questions from the audience as well as people ask, ask questions. But, but my first question is, um, after premiering this this deeply personal film um, in front of the the whole world and your family um, a year ago, what what has it been like for you to to travel and or <laughs> not travel virtually share the film with the world and now to have the film in distribution through through Cinema Guild and being seen in so many places and by so many people. What is it like one one year later? Well, I will say that when I was working on this film, it was the kind of project that kind of stayed in the project state for years, I mean, for decades, because I was scared to even move it into the word film, let alone to what I would say is the graduation day, it becomes a movie. So when it's a project, it's something that you're completely in. And in a way you can relish that. You can relish the privacy, you can enjoy the mistakes because you know nobody cares. You can be sloppy. There are all of these different ways that it's just kind of an extension of your life. But then again, because it was an extension of my life, it always, it all, it, it kept moving with me wherever I was. In fact, I, you know, I had 16 millimeter films and super eight films and high eight films, and they would just would move as I moved from California to New York, to Baltimore, to back to New York. It was always with me. And whenever I saw my father, I would be shooting. But then January, 2020, all of that changed because it was no longer um, just, uh, a project or a film, which was the, for me the editing process, product, process, it became a movie, which is sort of the, it has this opportunity to circulate and to exist outside of you. But with this film, it was never really outside of me because it was so much about my own 
explorations of my relationship to my dad, but also my curiosity about how families work and don't work and how they adjust, how you find, like you search for an equilibrium and then you recognize that you won't have that. And that more, um, more kind of archetypal situation, that, that way that you see that there are always obstacles to communications, to relationships, that you're always kind of trying to understand what is your relationship to this group of core people. That was something that now over the years has allowed me to have some really incredibly deep conversations with people I don't know, men and women. Um, and, and, and that actually can, you know, has crossed oceans and, and the fact that it's been virtual has actually given me a chance to have a different kind of conversation because usually as a filmmaker, I travel a lot with my own movies. So I have these pretty meaningful conversations with people right after the movie, either in a formal Q and A or in the lobby, but I can't write it all down. But now people are writing to me a lot through my website or they might know me and they're writing really, really like thoughtful, almost essay kind of pieces about their own experiences. And so I have this folder with probably hundreds of exchanges, correspondences that I've had. And that I think is a, a product of that weird, terrible situation that we're in right now is that the epistolary um, has had to replace the conversation and we have it on zoom, but I mean the re the actual conversation in mm. person. Yeah, no, that's, that's, well, it's interesting thinking about sort of time and, and sort of where we are now. When, when did you start making the film? Uh, um, I kind of started when early on, like when I just decided I was going to be a filmmaker. So I'm talking about the late eighties. Uh, you know, I was already making movies before that, but then I thought I am a filmmaker, like around 87, 89. And then I also thought, okay, I want to understand who my dad is and I want to like engage with him. And he's very project oriented. So I'll say, dad, I'm making a movie about you. And then there became a, a, another level of call it cooperation. But the problem was that I kept asking the same questions over and over again, and I wasn't very inventive in that way because there are kind of paradigmatic questions that, what, that we ask of our parents. And that wasn't leading me to the kind of deeper understanding of who he was. And, and actually when I first started making the film, I made, I made two, two others prior to this one um, I'm, because I was interested in the ways that you can actually understand another human being at all. Can you? Can you understand your own son? Can you understand your sister? Really, like how their minds work. You're always, there's always some kind of a uh, veil or wall in between. So I made a film about a total stranger. I made a film about a, a very distant relative. And then I, the one I thought would be the easiest, which was about the person I knew the best, in that construct was the hardest. So it was a, it's kind of a triptych. Um, the other, one of the films is called States of Unbelonging and the other one is called The Last Happy Day. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess thinking about, can you, can you ever actually know another person that you're in relationship to, to, of course begs the question, can you ever actually know yourself? And, and making a film like this and especially um, the the story that you that you tell as as the narrator of the film and and the construction of the story do do you think the experience of making the film brought you to another place of of self knowledge or does it feel like there was there was a construction and when you watch the film you're watching you know some other self or some other constructed person that's telling a story about these people that you, the real you is somehow in relationship with? Uh, I think that while I was writing for this film, I was also doubting, doubt, doubting myself as a 
a person who was willing to be this open, you know, because you can hide behind your art or you can hide behind your artifice and you, you know, you can play tricks, you can make in documentary, we often make films about other people and the fingerprint has to do with the editing or with the engagement with the, uh, the subjects, the people in front of the camera. And I had made so many films in which I was talking to other people and asking them to, to like open up their lives. And I just probably about three years ago said, I've been making this film and avoiding it, making, avoiding, making, avoiding. It's time for me to, to engage with the, the documentary process um, in the way that I hope people who are in my movies will. And the problem was that I kept uh, literally scratching everything out when I was writing or I'd look at film footage I'd shot and I thought it was atrocious and lazy and, you know, uh, like very judge, I was very, very judgmental. And then the content of it also gave me shame sometimes. So that div divide between the, the, the sensibility of it and the, the kind of, um, call it subject matter. And then also the, you know, I would look at it from the, like the lens of an HD camera and say, oh my God, it's so, degraded now it's so old and then I'm saying like well so are you <laughs> and so it's we're all old like I aged you know we say film is 24 frames per second and I'm 24 hours per day and I'm aging and so it's time to finish it <laughs> yeah um it it's uh I wanna, you know what I want to come back in just a minute to to this idea of avoidance um because that's something I've been thinking about a lot and in a way it's sort of a, a there's a I've been thinking about the film and it's to me at least a major theme of of the film is you know is part of the story that I see here is is the lengths that someone's psyche will go to avoid certain kinds of of conflicts right I mean that it's come back to that in just in just a minute but um I, I was thinking about the title and I thought a, a lot about the title when you when you initially told us about it at Slam Dance, film about a father who, and then it's open-ended and that it, it resonates with a film that was very influential to you. And so I wanna hear a little bit about that. And then also thinking about the fact that when you have an open-ended title like that, words tend to fill themselves in to that, that space. And I'm curious to know about the kinds of words that are filling themselves in there for you now and the kind of words that you've heard from other people in relation to the I, film. I really love, uh, I'll say one thing about the title, which was the title itself was inspired by a 1974 film by Yvonne Rayner, who's a kind of grand dame of avant-garde film of uh, um, contemporary dance in a, you know, the, she's done some of those radical work choreography like of the 20th century. So her work, a uh, film about a woman who was uh, important to me. She has, a, in that film, she has a way of looking at the family structure and kind of being, she's probably more cynical than I am. She's also looks at the construction of narrative. So it's family and narrative in general. And that idea of of the filmmaker being omniscient or the characters, like she, you know, she plays with literary tropes, how characters hear each other and through through the conceit of the film. And there's all of these different kind of suggestions of, of, of the way that we look at each other and the way that we think about perception. So that was important to me. But I also just genuinely love the title because I probably provide more questions and ellipses in my work than I do answers. So if you say film about a father who, as you suggested, people em can embrace it and integrate it into their own experience. And that's what I wanted. And I wanted to like kind of disrupt uh, like the grammar of of being more explicit, like the grammar where you would have the second part of that clause. So you would have who is, you know, who is here, who is 
kind, who is famous or, you know, something. But, you know, the, it's not my job as a filmmaker and is never been to provide a complete answer, but to make the questions more resonant, I guess. Mm -hmm. So what are the words that, that fill themselves in for you right now? Film uh, about a father who... Yeah, I would say... <laughs> um, loving, complicated, enigmatic, um, self-centered, uh, secretive, but open, you know, many different things, you know, all those things. Um, and it has to do with the, com actually the complexity, that's kind of a lazy word. So I'm gonna take that one back because every human being is complex. But I think the feelings that I brought to it, which bring in a kind of rage, and I definitely felt that way, and a forgiveness. And I wanted to be able to have and all those two emotions, most importantly, and I made, you know, while editing the film, I made versions that were total forgiveness, versions that were total rage, and those all both either or seemed too simple. So it was finding not a happy medium, but ha finding a way to acknowledge both of those was super hard. Uh, and one of the ways that I did it was um, to to record rather than just to write. So I recorded myself speaking and then I transcribed that and then that became the writing and I was less likely to filter and censor myself in that way. Interesting. What, I, what I'm hearing in a way when I think about it and especially when I think about, and this, as someone who has had several projects that have uh, been, been in the project stage for you know as long or maybe even longer than than uh this one was for you that that somehow that open-endedness in the title was also the key to making it a movie in a way right that that when i think about it i think well why does it take so long to finish something because you're trying to fill in that you know film about a father who X or Y or Z and which is it? And then once you know what it is, then you can make it a movie. And here's, and here's the movie that tells you this. And then somehow that accepting that it was gonna be open-ended in the way that it had to be open-ended is something that allowed the, the project to become a movie and to be, and to be shared with the world. Thank you for saying that. I, I really, um, I, I really think that took me many years to figure out um, that I don't think the intention of a work of, of any kind is to is to resol offer resolution. Um, and so, because if you offer resolution, then I ultimately I don't think there's any resonance. So it's 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 not. You don't want it to be frustratingly incomplete but you want it to, to carry with people. And I don't really care, you know, I don't think that what I'm trying to do is that you leave this movie and you know us really well. And in fact, if I did want to do that, I would have provided a family tree from the beginning. And I would have said, now I need you to understand us. And that kept uh, rearing its head like don't you want a family tree this is a this is about relationships and kinships and and all those anthropological things and I thought but I'm not an anthropologist I'm actually interested in something more raw you know and so if if the chrono and that's why I didn't make the film in a chronological way I made it in a more associative way I actually was working with Rebecca Shappas the editor and we uh, we made spent a year making 12 experimental films that I knew would eventually became one movie. But since I wasn't trying to follow a thesis, I was trying to follow moments and elements and, and sensibilities. And, and I guess that's what I'm better at. You know, Even that, though I was a history major in college, I think that I always kind of resisted the one thesis. So, uh, and so that 
I always felt that filmmaking offered me a chance to take what history had to offer, but then to play. So. Yeah, no, that's great. And I, one of the things that makes it a movie though, again, and, and I think your, your great triumph with this project um, among others is the, the unfolding and, and, and the revelation and, and the sense of discovery. And I, you know, I've watched the film four times now and I, you know, and I, I feel like I learn new things every time and it unfolds in such, in such a beautiful. That's probably way. because there are 12 films in there. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to say something for, for um, our friends who are, who are watching, which is um, we're, we're talking and we're having a great conversation, but we're also very curious to hear any, any questions that, that folks have from the, audience, this is a great chance to ask Lynn your, your questions. And so if you have any, just please send them in the chat on the, on the webinar or um, on the eventive chat or YouTube chat, and, and they'll be passed on to us here and, and we'll be able to, to address some of those questions as well. We've got plenty of time to do that. Um, but, but thinking about, about the unfolding um, and, and Again, I, and I will say to everybody who's watched the movie, it, it is going to reward multiple viewings. You'll you'll see and learn new things, not not only about Lynn and her father and her family, but I, at least in my experience, you'll learn things about yourself every time you watch the movie. Which is, you know, I don't know what else you can ask from uh, a work of art. So that's that's a wonderful thing. But in terms of that kind of learning, once Lynn, once you shared it with your with your siblings, especially, I'm, I'm thinking about the, the siblings who we meet um, through, through the film uh, a year ago, what, what kinds of, of stories and discovery have, have ensued in, in the time sort of since you've shared uh, this story in this form with, with your siblings? Um, hmm, that's, you know, I think that about two and a half years ago, when I, as I was editing the film, uh, I started to re go deep with my siblings, and we're there's a really long space of time between us. You know, I'm born in 1961, and I have a the young my youngest sister was born in 1995. So there's a there's generations between us, and by knowing that in a sense we made the film together, there became, a, and, and, and they were like my sister Madison who was at the films, she flew in from San Diego to the film and uh, to see the film for the, at Slam Dance. And it was so meaningful to me because she, she tr I think she trusted me and she, and I was scared that she would be scared, you know, maybe embarrassed. There are scenes of her own wedding in the film, but there was a sense that we all, I would say we actually became closer uh, in, in the fact that we each shared parts of ourselves in this structure, which is the movie. Um, as, as you know, my life started in Memphis. The, move, the very earliest footage in the entire film is from 1965 the year that Ira was born, because I can see him as a little baby and there, we're there and my dad's holding us and then you see my mother. And, and so there's a way that, that for the, we call ourselves like the first generation of my dad's kids, that uh, we, we connect through this film in a lot of ways because I think he kind of introduced us to the Memphis Demi mom and to the kind of like bohemian, underground side of of the city you know it's a there's a it's as if there was there were parts of Greenwich Village in Memphis and a lot of people don't know that and that side of like that belief in art and that confidence I think came from those years in Memphis and um so but my other siblings have the whole Park City side so their relationship to the film has a lot to do with the natural world and with what my dad wanted from nature and the way that he developed it and what does develop mean 
like develop means not necessarily to improve, it also means to exploit. So that those were conversations that, that we had. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. Um, well, let's talk about Memphis for just for just a little bit. Um, and and the and I see we have a few questions here from the audience as well, so we will uh, we'll we'll come back to those in just a second. But but just talking about Memphis for just for just a little bit longer, and especially it it almost feels like the sort of um, you know for those of us from Memphis and in Memphis, you know, we're looking at the footage and trying to recognize certain places and scenes and so on. But but in many ways, it really is this sort of Park City and, and New York and story. Um, and so what do you, for, the, for this Memphis audience, are there any, any special Memphis resonances or places um, that you think we should, we should know about and think about in relation to the film? Okay, I'm gonna say there are things that I wish were in the film. Like, I'm just gonna say that I wish Ashler Hall were in the film because my dad turned Ashler Hall into a restaurant. It was a failed restaurant, but he decorated it with things from people's attics. So I wish Ashler Hall was in it. My father also lived for many years on Adam Street, the Molly Fontaine house. So there was a way that, that dad like appreciated like the the kind of whimsy of Memphis and 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 in a sense taught us and guided us to seeing that and to seeing the kind of um, wildness of it could also be very creative and um, the, for example we spent a lot of time on the Mississippi River on my father's boat. And I've written about that and I have a collection of poems and a lot of it has to do with Memphis. And um, so there were ways that, that we would be uh, on the river and there you would feel like that's like the Delta. And, but there are other ways that that um, felt scary like because it's actually a river that moves really, really quickly. So those were kind of situations that I was in a lot and um, like there was the adventure and then there was the kind of nervousness of that adventure. I guess any child has that. Um, and I mean, there's so many things that, Im I can say it in a more impressionistic way than I can say it, that I have footage of it. Like hanging out at Huey's was very important because you would just be around all these people who were doing things because they wanted to do them and they, one thing that's fascinated me is that Huey's has duplicated itself multiple times. So it's like, I have a memory of Huey's as the restaurant and now it exists in multiple places, but that has to do with like where I am right now, the way memory, I'm actually in my grandmother's apartment. So um, she's dead now, <laughs> but we're kind of dismantling this parts of this apartment and here we are here. And so um, I thought it would be a good setting uh, and this, this, this town in Florida was a big part of the movie that you could see it. And it was also a place where my father felt very out of place. So this is not his typical situation, but, um, I just decided to, to do our zoom here today. Uh, so I think it's interesting to think about the imprint of place. And especially in this movie that you can be in a place and be of it or you can be of a place and just be in it, but not a part of it. Yeah, yeah I, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna pick up on something you said there about your dad and his feeling out of place there, and and it's it's in in Palm Beach is the is the yes. location. Yep, yeah. um, because the appearance, right, the the surface that's seen in the movie is that he knew exactly what to do and exactly what was expected of yeah. him. And something that you captured very well was, yeah, the, that ritualized behavior. Yeah, so tell us you about that. You put on a costume. I think yeah. that my father was quite clever in that way. Um, and, you know, you think about what is a businessman. So a businessman, I think, is a person who can put on the right outfit in the right place and take care of what he needs to take for needs to take care of. And there's many of us who kind of like, I identify by what I wear and I'm not gonna change that. So um, I think that that 
adaptability, but also there were kinks, a lot of kinks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's hard to imagine uh, having so many compartments in one's life that like my father had, um, because uh, these days with cell phones and things, people are always photographing. So you don't have these rigid divisions between uh, this life and that life and secret. I think, I don't know, I think secrets are kind of probably harder to keep these days because you're always being watched. And that it would be, have been a different film to have started in 2021. Um, and, you know, like the film footage I have from the early 60s, um, we had 12 minutes total of my entire childhood and every frame I count. And think about now, it's like a tur if you, Thanksgiving, someone would shoot 12 minutes of cook, cutting the turkey, something. Yeah. So we, you know, we had very little, not to say, we just did because people weren't as, as oriented to, to product, like reproducing life on media. Mm. Let me, I want to go back just just quick, real quick to something that you said about your, you know, your dad as a businessman and putting on the costume and doing what what had to be done. Did, was I mean, and, and when where you are in your grandmother's apartment and so on, did, did it did it feel like that relationship with his mom was was taking care of business and that was the that was kind of. I know. think I in some ways I thought that, and in other ways I thought that they thrived on each other. They, yeah. you know, I think that's an interest. I think maybe, I think you've hit on something that's very interesting that I, that I, that sometimes that we love in, in film and in, in story of any kind that we realize that when two people are in conflict with each other, they bring each other to life. And sometimes uh, when our li lives seem to placid conflict adds a kind of, charge and i think that's how they worked on each other they there was it was so tempestuous believe it or not but in that check there's another thing that is part of this film and i was talking about the demi mond of memphis we we're all about like the we move we all move between different sectors of our lives it's it's not just between your job and your home life you you also move between between places where you are served and where you are serving. There's a, you have different roles. And so I'm, I'm very interested in all the different roles that we play. And I think in families, very much, we, have, we all have roles where we're the giver and the taker. And, and that's like something that becomes frozen. And I think in this film, I wanted to kind of analyze that. Why is it that within this little teeny cosmos, we, we play so many we, we, we impose so many different kinds of um, expectations. And in most of it, and this is another part of this film, when your subject or your star isn't particularly verbal, you have to look at how actions work and, and um, or how, how body, you know, as we call it, body language, all of those things ultimately said more. Yeah. Well, you're, you're giving us so much to, to think about and for everybody who hasn't watched the movie yet I think it, it's um it's just thinking about these these ideas that that Lynn is is bringing forward just adds so much depth and richness to the to the experience and I actually can't wait to watch it again thinking oh, no. about <laughs> yeah, so, well, this, <laughs> this, that's what happens right when you put it out there like people can keep watching and watching well it's so uh, interesting that you say that because I make a I, I kind of call myself an experimental documentary yeah. maker and for so long, um, I would I'd like I'd make a film that maybe was more, even more on the experimental side, and plenty of people would say, "That was really interesting, Lynn. I wish I had the chance to watch it again." And then I'd say, "Oh yeah," because this kind of predated all the virtual, and you know the, that you had you could watch it again. But I liked that they even had the desire to watch it, and I thought about poetry, like with poetry we say, oh yeah, well, I got to the end and then I wanted to do, read it again because then I could appreciate the language or then I could appreciate the rhythm. And at first I was just trying to get at what the themes were. And, but people never think, except people in the avant-garde world or experimental world, 
otherwise they think, okay, I saw it. And they, 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 ha they bring a whole different set of um, kind of expectations. And, and so uh, I'm, I hope that there is enough to see in the second time viewing. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have some great questions Good. from folks. And uh, so the, the first question, um, this, is, this is a really good one. It's uh, Laura Jean Hawking wants to know, was there anyone in your family or close circle of friends who did not agree with your portrayal of your father? Um, that's a, so far, um, no one has not agreed, but I had an interesting experience when his fraternity brothers, they call themselves the boys of, nine, of 54. They're from the University of Florida. They heard about the movie kind of through Google or something. And so they, they meet every month and they contacted me really out of the blue. And they said, we would like to see the movie. And I was really nervous because I thought this is not going to be the man they knew in the fraternity meetings. And he loves those men. And I thought, oh God, I don't want to like, out him and and they just really were please man we love your dad and I think they thought it would be all about his like wacky business practices and things like that but I finally said okay and I asked dad if it was okay my dad and he said it was so I showed it to them and then we had like a kind of a this was um about eight months ago and we had a zoom meeting and there I was with about 15 84 85 year old men and I was very nervous. I didn't invite my, my dad because I thought they're going to all be devastated. And they loved it. And they just said, well, we didn't know all this about Ira. We have to call him. But they, quite a few of them said, I wish my daughter would make a movie about me. And I said, oh, really a tell-all like this? But it's not really a tell-all. And they said, yeah, because it, val it, it, um, it, it says I lived on the world, the earth. I, this is the life I led, and you took the time to follow your dad around all those years. And they said, my daughter didn't do that. So that was a bit of a, they're like brothers. They're not my brothers, but they're, they sort of said to me, we all need ways to recognize our, our legacy, even if it's a messy one. Yeah. I mean, you know what, in a way, I'm, I'm just thinking about it. It, it says you love your father very much. And I'm, I'm thinking about something my, my therapist said to me not, you know, not too long ago, the, the opposite of love, right? A lot of times we think the opposite of love is, is hate. Um, but th this idea is the opposite of love is indifference. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here there, you have so much engagement, right? With, with this relationship and, and all of the complexity that, uh, that uh, he, he brings to life and brought to life. Um, thank you, Laura Jean, for that. Laura, question. Laura Jean is an editor, right? Yes, yes. Well, I want to say something about it. Hi, Laura Jean, because yeah. I've seen your editing and I, I actually really, really loved her editing in the Antenna Club movie. I just thought that was so amazing. And I actually think that that movie is also about a family and it's also about a house. It's like, we talk about the family house. Well, the antenna club or the well or whatever you wanted to call it was a family. And it was this place in Memphis with a set of a lot of complicated relationships, people who had power, people who were allowed in, people who were scared to go in and all these things. But yet it was a place of um, like a magnet that drew people away sometimes from families that didn't understand them. And it was like an alternative family and I'm being sort of sociological, but I thought that the way that Laura um, created those associations between all different kinds of strangers, but people who, who were drawn to this one experience, which was so proud and so profound was really awesome. So I just want to say that. <laughs> here, here, yes. And wouldn't it be great if we were in the same room and we're actually like, you know. Yay, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, we have another another 
friend, another another filmmaker, um, asks the question. Alisa Blatice says, "Hello, Lynn." So there's another good question. It felt like you left out a lot of particulars regarding the details of your dad's parents. What did they do for a living? Question mark. Why did they hate each other? Does Ira have siblings of his own, et cetera? Okay. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Oh. Elisa and I went to junior high school. So I'm just, I like to add the Memphis part of it yeah. and maybe high school, but I think junior high and some elementary. Anyway, um, and sh you know, that question of details is really kind of critical. And it was another, another aspect of making this film that kind of kept stalling me because I felt like you, when you're making a film, you also have to give into the spirit of the film and realize that some details are fantastic. Like the detail that my dad owned two Cadillacs that were painted, that he painted to, um, the same color so that his mother wouldn't know that he had two when she came to visit. That to me was like kind of a parable it was kind of a, a strategy, a kind of way of learning about how people relate to each other. I, I thought about like Grimm's fairy tale, like things that people did in very elemental sit, situations and, and um, you know, like that was like a code that could have transposed to other things. Um, so that's like kind of a peculiar detail that I tell early in the film. Then the part about the, the parents um, I guess that I didn't feel my job was to elucidate something that was never completely clear to me, that what I wanted to talk about was the way that a child is always kind of pulling, like, give me more, give me more, tell me where I came from. And I, that would, that give me more feeling was more important to me than the more. So, um, you know, I can honestly tell you that I, there's enough in it, I think, in the film for you to know that my grandmother left her first husband, the real father of my father, but, and then there were a lot of problems and my father didn't end up with his mother again until 13 years later with, and, um, and, but what, again, was a small detail that resonated for me more in the film, in making this film was the fact that I didn't learn that my father's real name, like his first name was Nathan. It's like, that makes me feel insecure. How can I not know that? That if I don't know that, then there's plenty else I don't know. So I wanted to think about names and that for that to be an archetypal discovery. And I didn't care that you as people watching the film would know those names. It was just that I had the frustration of not knowing and discovering that I didn't know. So I kept looking for the emotional registers rather than the factual registers as something that I was trying to give to the audience. But as Elisa, Elisa mentioned, those were things that I had to debate. So I, there were lots of details, but what I chose to give to you all were the ones that I thought had like double meanings. Well, that, that actually leads right into our next question from mm -hmm. another filmmaker, friend of ours, Robert. Robert Gordon asks, in a film so long in process, you must have thought about and considered a lot of different opening shots, opening scenes. Why did you choose what you chose, the, the caring for the hair shot, to open the film? Mm. Uh, thank you, Robert. And I'm a big admirer. I'm just, these are all people like, I don't even know who's all here, but I, those are all people I know a bit. And I know Ro I've know i known Robert well for many years and I admire his filmmaking and, I'm, and his writing. And I know it's like, what's going to be the first sentence? It's, it's hard. And I never know. And I start most of my films from the center out. So I figure out the beginning when I'm finishing up the film and I definitely figure out the end when I'm finishing because it's not like a, a narrative film where I know where it's leading. Like it has a conclusion. I want it to end with, like, with multiple registers of emotion and thought. So um, my, 
interest in including the story of the not story, but the conceit of hair has to do with our culture and that like specifically my father always had longer hair than everybody else's fathers, always. And so I measured my comfortability in, in Memphis particularly, because I was a kid there, with how I felt about my father's hair. Like when he came to pick me up at school and his hair was four inches longer than everybody else's dad, and that made me feel different. And, it, and there was a, a leap, I guess, later than I'd like to admit, you know, maybe I was a conformist at that time, like teenage, preteens and teens can be, that I finally said, oh, it's cool that my father's hair is longer than everybody else's father's hair. But it took me years to recognize that that was special. And so that's one thing that, that I looked at hair, you know, in our society, hair means a lot. Like it, we were talking about wardrobe or costumes or clothing, but hair too will let you in the door in one place and not in the other. So I knew that hair had meaning. Um, and also as my father got older, I was often helping him get tangles out. And as I was doing that, the physicality of it, I realized that it had to do with a, a shift I had made in my own life, that I was no longer just his child, but I was his peer and also someone caring for him. And um, so I wasn't specifically going for like the metaphor of tangled hair, but I was, I, I, I found, you were asking about how the people have looked at this film in the year. Quite a few people have said that about hair and about, about the mess of it and my trying to get my way through. And so I appreciate that. And then the end of the film, just to talk about it, um, it's you, all, you also see the hair, but you also see him in front of this Anselm Kiefer painting where he's both present and with us, but also part of the, la the landscape of that painting. And then the very end is the um, credits. I, with all my movies, I, I try to do things with the credits that recognize the importance of all the people who worked on it, as well as th that integrating that with the, the visuals of like the conceits. Um, so I wanted it to look like, um, uh, sentence diagramming and also to look a little bit like a family tree. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm thinking about, again, about the title a little bit and, and imagine if it were called film about a daughter who, um, and, and how has that changed for you, you know, over, over the years of working on the project and then finishing the movie and sharing the movie with the world, your, your feelings about, I would say really even your own relationship with, with your father and your siblings and, and grandmother and, and, you know, where you are now in this, in this place, you know, who are you in relation to this story? You know, when I finished the film and was able to show it and showed it in, in at Slam Dance in Park City, and that was so scary and you were there and you probably remember, I don't know if you could tell, but I was shaking. I was so nervous and I kept saying, I'm so nervous, I'm so nervous. Um, but I was also extremely nervous about showing it in New York. And after I had the, the my local, my home, current hometown screening um, at the Museum of Modern Art, I, I walked out and we had a little party in a nearby restaurant and I felt like I actually could go on with the next chapter of my life. Like I had grown up and that um, I no longer was like, let's call it culpable of this forced amnesia. Like I couldn't, you know, I had reckoned with my own memories and with my own emotions and that I had actually played with them too. It's important to say play because in making a film, you have to find joy. So it wasn't, it, the film is not therapy. It, I mean, I, I like therapy. I, I am involved in that too, but it is not that. There's another kind of 
engagement with it with my own work. So I get when I'm working on something, I also find joy and I but I've worked on that for so long. So now I get to work on other things, but I also get to think about other things. I for with that movie for the throughout 2019, um, as I was editing it, almost every night I would wake up in the middle of the night uh, with two feelings. One was I've solved an editing quandary. And the other was I shouldn't be making this movie stop now. So every night I had the, either one or the other. Like if I had the editing strategy answer, then I could just like move on one step further. But if I had the, the doubt about whether this was worth like valuable and important to do, um, I would just say, and I'd ask everybody, if you had been around me at that point, I would have said, Ido, should I just stop making this movie? Um, and what, what kept you going? Well, two, probably two things. I mean, one was that I knew I couldn't go on to the next chapter of my life unless I finished it. And that was like a kind of a, a realization about myself. And the other was, I felt like I was actually getting getting somewhere. You were asked earlier about like, like understanding yourself. I felt like I was understanding myself that I didn't, that I was understanding feminism too. Um, because I made this movie very much in the, the thick of the um, Me Too movement, you know, and, and that I wanted to explore, you know, what, what masculinity is today. That part of feminism was, um, was to say that all men are not one way and that, that you have to confront men on certain things, but you also have to listen to them. And I think this is a, hopefully a transitional time for men. And I think this movie was an opportunity for me to, to look at that and also to hear from my brothers because they, they, were, they were also searching, like, did they want to be the Hugh Hefner of Park City? No, you know, but that would have been a draw for men several, a generation earlier, maybe, not every man, you know, not at all every man, but there's, there was an appeal, but I think that appeal has changed, so. Yeah, um, I, it's, I mean, I feel like we're just scratching the surface, right, as one, as one does, um, but I see just a couple more questions. Let's see, so we have um, Juliet Wishmeyer, hello, Gigi asking um what and and actually this this connects with with another i think very important area what what were your biggest challenges in in editing um and in, in terms of in terms of editing and then maybe just adding on to that um maybe you can tell us a little bit about the role of collaboration in in um sort of meeting those challenges um i really appreciate julia asking that She's my cousin. <laughs> um, oh, the question is, I'm reading now, it's from Adam, um, but they're really? both my cousins. So I'm hap happy to talk to them about filmmaking. And I, I know for sure that Adam thinks about filmmaking a lot. Um, and I know that Adam thinks a lot about music in film a lot. So I'm gonna say something about music in relationship to editing, because as I said, I, I had cut this film as 12 short experimental films at first because I was too intimidated by the enormity of it. And one of the things that I needed to do was then to break those films, pull them apart and to, and to weave them together. And I did that by working with this fantastic musician who's worked on um, five films with me, Stephen Vitiello. And so I didn't just work with him as transitions. You know how people always like, let's get the music, the composer in here and we need a transition. But I needed him to pull like concrete, what we call music concrete or con sounds from the old VHS tapes or sounds from recordings that I did in 1991 on quarter inch reel to reel or all of those things and to start building them as a present. So it wasn't just nostalgia, 
but it was about making you as viewers, listeners, feel the, the kind of exhilaration of the, the sound of the track in relationship to the images. And Stephen was really, really critical to that. Another thing about the editing was that I was very, very, very critical of the material that I shot decades ago from this really conventional point of view. And that was, okay, HD looks so good now and look at what I shot in VHS. And it's all kind of like degrade. It's not only didn't have it, didn't look as good then, but it looks worse now and it's been stored in garages sometimes. And so there were, I realized that, that every surface, a filmic surface is like a skin, it's an epidermis. So it's, that's what makes us different from each other. And the scratches or the, the fact that things had deteriorated, literally like the tape had deteriorated, actually made it more like a body. And so in the editing, I started to work with those surfaces like a body instead of just information. And so that was really, really, really a, kind of like a, call it like somatic, like the, the core, the whole thing was a body. And I was just dealing with different parts at different parts of the life of the film, the, the long-term film. Yeah. Uh, it's, some editing questions, some things that I played with. Yeah. Well, and it's so interesting to think about in terms of the editing, just, just how a film can operate at so many levels, right? We've been, we've been talking a lot about, about sort of content and maybe sort of psych, you know, psychological or, or uh, other areas of, of the storytelling. And now we have the mirrors that are, that are working with us. Um, but, but just thinking about textures and then the way that, that um, you bring back these textures throughout and they sort of resonate with each other is, is I love I, it's one of the things I love about film is the the texture of it and the sometimes muted and less detail like actually Elisa asked earlier about details and I, some things I like about the 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 er, earlier formats like VHS or that you don't get so much detail and you get an impression of something like there's a shot I have in the film three times uh not the same shot, it's different parts of one about seven minute shot that my father recorded um, in the uh, late eighties. And so um, it was so degraded, the material that you really just got sort of impressionistic colors like pink, pink and green and blue and, it, and some browns. And it was on a, a, like a little stream and three children were playing there, my sister, sister and two brothers. And, but the thing is that I it looks like the, the perfect impressionist painting. It's or classical painting. It's like a triangle. It has that, that golden structure or graphic. And that was foot, footage that I initially dismissed. And then I started to like it because it had grown up with me and older with me. And I started to love it so much that I have it three times. And um, Adam asked about the editing. I realized that each time that you saw it, you don't see more detail visually, you see the same, but you know more and you can, you can pour in more narrative detail. So that's actually more resonant to me than the detail of like, can you see the lines on the skin perfectly or can you see like the edge of the ear, whatever, something like that, which a contemporary, uh, you know, HD camera lens could do, like a macro lens. And, um, but I liked that things, the detail was in the knowing, not just the, the viewing. Yeah. Do you, do you remember being there in 1989 and shooting or whenever and shooting that footage? You know, when you, does it, do, yeah. Well, this is another good point. I didn't shoot that footage and I wasn't huh. there. My father did. And that actually was a realization that I garnered in making the film um, about a year into the editing. And that's that what would make it interesting with a subject who wasn't very, who isn't very verbal was to see the world through his eyes. And that actually was a really important revelation in mind that I that will, ho I hope, keep for a long time. That if you're trying to understand another person, seeing the world through their eyes is like, the is phenomenal. And a camera can do that. So we usually think, oh, I'm gonna look through 
the look at material that like the great cinematographers shot. I'm going to make a movie about, you know, someone who, who is visual. But why do you do that? Why not just make, why not try to understand another person by the way that they see even someone who just sees in the most, call it prosaic ways or, or like non, you know, non visually educated in fact, like in, in the sort of conventional sense, like, oh, you went to art school or something like that. Because if you wanna understand someone's psyche to have a chance to access their perception is pretty incredible. So that's why I went back and looked at footage that my dad shot um, in a, the most casual way you possibly could. <laughs> yeah, and it, well, and it and it comes it comes across. Did you did you then have a feeling as you were juxtaposing you know back to editing footage that he shot with footage that that you shot that in a way it's the sort of meeting of the minds is like, well, you're seeing the world this way and he's seeing the world this way and you're putting those things side yeah. by side somehow, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's like, um, that's kind of like one of the things that makes you love filmmaking or film. You know, that's why I think I became a filmmaker because it could hold so much. Like I love poetry and I write and I've all, all, always done like visual things myself, um, but, you, once I got involved in experimental filmmaking, I thought, this, this little camera and that editing equipment, I can, anything that comes to mind, absolutely anything can find its way in that garbage can. And um, also multiple points, like you were just saying, multiple points of view. And that was like actually the crux of this whole movie, to tell you the truth, was inspired by, by like Cubist portraits, Picasso or Bra you know, that you look at a face, like I could draw your face right now and I could do a contour drawing and I could get the perspective correct from right here. But I actually want to do something like what this room, this is one of them. Like you're seeing, you're seeing me from multiple perspectives um, and you are, this is kind of literal in this case, but in my, in my movie, that's why I brought in my, my sisters and brothers and some of the girlfriends and my mom, like my mom gives me a chance to understand our story from years ago. And she has, she has this uncanny ability to look back at that time um, with, with like wisdom and a kind of groundedness that I haven't gotten yet, but I work to that with my, with the film. Yeah. So, I mean, so many fascinating points, points of view. And again, if anybody hasn't watched the movie yet, I, I'm sure now you, you really sort of um, are having a taste of what, of what you're going to experience there. I think we've got time for one more question has just come in from Kathy Stoyer. Hello, Kathy. Um, how did your father react to the film? Did he share the appreciation that his fraternity brothers had? Did he recognize himself or provide any corrective? Um. Kathy is my very oldest friend in the world. So I'm very happy to have Kathy here. We grew up together and um, um, I think that my father really appreciated that I made the movie. I think it was also a, watching it gave him some chances to regret, not what he did, but to, no, no regrets, not the right word. What's that? To, he said to me, I hope to do better in the future. Now, you know, he's an older person and, and, but I think that he, I think he's actually pleased that he has all those kids. And I think he's happy that we're actually there for each other. And he's taught us to be that way. We actually all meet now every Sunday on a Zoom, all of us, all nine of us. And so we, um, uh, maybe the movie was a little bit of a part of that um, coming together. Uh, I, I, I probably couldn't say that he learned about himself, but I think he is, I couldn't say, you know, I, he hasn't, I, I, would, I would be misrepresenting his reality. And that was one of the things I was actually trying to do in the film is not represent to, to witness his reality, but not try to represent it or articulate it for him. Um, but 
he seems pleased like there was a picture of him in the New York Times and there was a piece that talked about the kind of the 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 way that the film deals with family and he has that out so I think he feels like it's not it's not like oh I'm a movie star it's not that but I think he appreciates that his life was recognized yeah well it's a it's a it's a beautiful and and very uh, you know I think an incredibly challenging uh, accomplishment <laughs> actually on your, on your challenging to make part. I can say that yeah. yeah yeah very very challenging well thank you thank you so much for for sharing for sharing this sharing the film sharing your your thoughts on this conversation are, are there any any other ideas especially for this Memphis audience knowing that people are going to be able to, to come back and and you know watch this uh, discussion anything you you we didn't cover that that you feel like we should uh, talk about a little bit yeah oh that's that's real I I it's interesting because I as people were asking about like what of Memphis is in it and and um, I I I actually came, you know, there's, I'll talk about some outtakes. I did come back to Memphis and shoot by the river and shoot in places that were important to me, but that's not the kind of movie I was made. I couldn't, I wasn't trying to recreate things. I was trying to carve out from the littlest bit that I had. And that's been a way that I've made films for like all my life, where you just take a little piece and let it, let the it's like synecdoche, whatever, you know, let the piece speak for something bigger. So all of that is still in my computer, but um, it, it, it was important to me to keep being, like there actually some of my favorite footage, probably my very favorite is in my mom's house now and, and sort of seeing her and the groundedness that she has in her life. And I think a lot of us have had pain in our lives and then we, we re and she, she's actually been my big, one of my biggest supporters for this movie. And I think it's because she moved, like I talked about, I moved to another phase of my life by finishing the movie. She moved to another phase of her life by getting divorced. But, but when you do that and you know that you've closed one chapter and you can move on to another, that's really like a valuable mature time of maturing. And I'm, I'm still trying to mature. <laughs> um, so that's some, those are some things that I, I like, there's actually a lot, like, there's quite a bit of Memphis, but most of it's domestic. So it's not like, oh, I recognize that. But you, you know, the, the houses, like our childhood homes leave such an imprint. Uh, even if you lived in many childhood homes, you have like a recognition of the way the light comes in a window. And that's been um, really key to me is that chance to revisit those places. Yeah. Um, no, I will say one other thing. Um, I, I, if people are interested, I, um, I have films that are currently screening um, in virtual. This film is screening in a number of virtual cinemas around the country, but um, the uh, Los Angeles Film Forum is showing four, or four other films of mine that I worked with Stephen Bittiello on right now until Sunday. And so that includes Your Day is My Night uh, and Tip of My Tongue. And also Tip of My Tongue actually was in Indy Memphis and as was uh, The Washing Society was at Indy Memphis. So those movies are showing right now at Los Angeles Film Forum. And then um, I have another group of films showing um, in San Francisco at the Roxy Cinema, which is on 16th Street in the Mission. And there's about eight films there, but one of the films there I made with my sister, Dana, Which Way is East? So it was kind of a family collaboration. So though that film will be up probably, or series up probably another week at the Roxy. So if people want to see other of my work, they're there. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn. It really was, was just great to share this experience with you and, and with everyone here uh, participating in Indie Memphis Movie Club. And uh, again, the, the movie film about a father who is gonna be available through Indie Memphis Virtual Cinema through this Thursday, February 18th at 11.59 PM. And also in other places along with uh, these retrospectives that uh, Lynn told us about. And 
One one more quick quick thing that that comes to mind. Um, how about your your poetry book that you that you read from the first time when we were at Slam Dance and and just that was felt like another kind of remarkable uh, milestone and and new chapter. What what's going on with that? Um, so I made a book uh, or made a wrote a collection of fifty poems when I turned fifty, which is now a while back. But it took me like years to. I turned fifty uh, almost ten years ago. And then um, I spent all these years trying to write a poem about each year and about the intersection of public events with very, very personal things. And, and so uh, I did a reading in, Slam, uh, in Park City when I was out there. And I've actually been doing some virtual readings like uh, in different places, a place called Beyond Baroque. Um, but that, that book, since you mentioned it, um, well, it's on the big A, but it's also, a, um, bookshop.org and at small press distribution. And um, I did a reading in Memphis for sure. And I, that was like just a, a joy uh, at Burke's. Um, so that was actually one of the very, very first readings to and to all oh, again, to bring it back home. I, you, I was thinking early about Janis Joplin. And when Janis Joplin went back to the town in Texas and she was like, ooh, I think. And I always worried, what happens if, and that's never happened in Memphis. There's a way that, uh, there's like a love that Memphis has for Mem for people from town, the same town. Yeah. Well, how, how wonderful to be able to share the love tonight. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, the one thing I didn't learn how to do was officially to end the uh, this discussion. So I'm gonna rely on the folks from Indy Memphis to do that, but thank, thank you, you everyone. Yes.